surely it'll be remembered as a breakthrough moment or a breakthrough month even for women's football. Team USA keeping their title after a World Cup final like that, like the rest of the tournament here in France, kept its promise. The 2-0 win against the reigning European champion Dutch side included marquee names, collective skill, flashes of brilliance, and a sprinkling of controversy, this time with VAR technology arguably changing the course of the match. We'll be asking our panel about, well, the signature boisterousness of an American squad that brings a new kind of culture to football and takes on all comers, including sometimes their own president. Should they indeed go to the White House? What about their call for equal pay with the men's national side? The game's biggest star, Norway's Ada Hegeberg, boycotted the tournament over that issue. Now, with TV ratings records shattered, how will this World Cup more broadly impact women's sport? How many girls will be inspired to play team sports competitively? Can success on the pitch, well, change the world? We'll be talking about it today in the France 24 debate. A, a World Cup to remember. Joining us, France 24 sports editor, Kedavon Gorgistani, bags unpacked? Bags uh, not even unpacked, they're waiting for me in the newsroom, just arrived. <laughs> okay, also with us an eight-time national champion who as a striker for the French national team took part in the very first women's Euro, Nicolas Barre, a tireless advocate of gender parity. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Uh, also uh, with us, former sports reporter Nita Wiggins, who's the author of Civil Rights Baby. Welcome yes. back to the show. Hello, thank you. Happy to be here. And we have an American, so it's only fair yeah. that we invite as well a Dutchman. Uh, Ruben Slaughter <laughs> of Eurosport, the co-author of Football Investigation, Everything You Need to Know About Football in Russia. Happy to be here. Thank glad, you. Glad to welcome <laughs> you. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. Uh, they've now won the World Cup on every continent the tournament's been played on. Team USA returning home with their fourth title. Camille Dirac has more. The United States celebrated a record-breaking fourth Women's World Cup. And fans who couldn't make it to France joined in the fun back home. In Chicago, the atmosphere was joyous as 9,000 fans gathered together at Lincoln Park to watch the match. I think you could feel the energy the minute we got out of the car and stepped into Lincoln Park. And we, that's what we were hoping for. That's why we came yeah. here and didn't want to watch it at home. So it was, the energy was incredible. This latest World Cup victory is a special moment for women's football, as the entire country, men as well as women, came together to support their national team. I have a new perspective on women's after watching this. Uh, I can see the hard work they put in, um, and it makes me really... Uh, Makes me really proud as an American, as a supporter, that um, we can put them more in the spotlight. New Yorkers watched the win on a giant screen near the World Trade Center. Some fans believe the victory is a much needed morale boost in a country that feels increasingly hostile to women. There are not many things to be proud of right now in America, especially when you're a woman and like it feels like the world is kind of against you, but it felt like it was so much bigger than it was, you know? Like, it was not like, yes, we won the World Cup. The team will be welcomed back home with a victory parade in New York on Wednesday. Yeah, and for the final of the most watched women's tournament ever, you could argue it's still all eyes on the four-time champions uh, and their player of the tournament, Captain Megan Rapinoe. Good morning, America. We're coming home. Hey, France has been amazing. We love France. Thank you for everything. But like, we can't wait to get home. We've been here for so long, been on the road for so long. Uh, we're thrilled to be heading back to New York. Yeah, I guess those those sunglasses betray a short night, uh, Kedavon Gorgeous. Yes, uh, there was a lot of uh, partying uh, going on, and it started in uh, the uh, locker rooms at the Gulbama uh, Stadium, where uh, Megan Rapino used to play because she played for uh, Lyon, so she knows uh, that stadium. And there was a lot of champagne, and I think it continued throughout the night. More more broadly, the, the atmosphere inside of the stadium. I, I guess I'll put it to you, Nicolas Bar. This was a final that f fit its its promise. Huh? It was it was it was definitely exciting to watch. We saw some amazing saves in the first half and a beautiful goal in the second. Uh, it was a, a final, little bit blocked, because uh, the, the the both team has to to win, and uh, you can't play a final. <laughs> 
you want to win. Um, I prefer personally the semi final against England. USA for, England. For soccer, for the, the beautiful play of beautiful soccer. But a final has to be played and has to be won. So um, the VAR has made the decision, but everybody says that it was right. The, 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 there is a fault and the decision was good. So in this case, we, don't, um, we are not able to speak about the fact. All right. Uh, uh, this fact. Not, not everyone in the Netherlands agrees, <laughs> and there was 88% of the country, apparently, in front of their TV sets uh, during the final on Sunday. The Orange Army was also there in Lyon, although they weren't as many as American fans, for, yes, another World Cup final, three for the men, one for the women, four finals, four losses. We are very disappointed because we entered this final with a lot of confidence. We thought we could win. But we still reached the final. We still got very far. We must remain positive. Very disappointed. The penalty was not justified. It's not fair. Very annoying. The penalty was not justified. Was the penalty justified? Of course it was justified. But she also said it, huh? the, the, the defender, Stephanie van der Gracht, who made the foul, she said after the match straight away that it was a foul. Well, if even she said it, so for me it's no problem, but I can imagine that when you're in the stadium, you may be a little bit angry. I, why not? Uh, also because we had a lot of VR situations during the tournament, of course, but for me it was no, uh, no discussion, no. I, I, if it hadn't been... Uh, awarded, there wouldn't have been a controversy, would there? I mean, was it really dangerous play? Well, it, the problem is that considering, as you said, there were a lot of VAR calls in this competition and there were uh, VAR decisions for way less than that. And seeing that the foot was high, it was there, it's harsh. It might be harsh. I don't think it's controversial. But either way, it could have gone. If she hadn't called it, if she had said it's not a foul, People would have debated a little bit, but I don't think it was that controversial. There were plenty more controversial calls throughout this competition than this one. Nina Wiggins? Well, I was a basketball referee, and the number one goal of the person on the field is to preserve the safety of players. And so when there is contact, and this game had violent contact, when there is contact, an official has to step in and say, let's pause, let's look at that. And so I, I don't have a problem with that call. And sure, it was the right call, but officials have to try and keep the players safe. But you, you're breaking the rhythm of the game. You, you, team sports, when you play them, the referees are good sometimes, sometimes they're not so good. When you're a good team, you play to the strengths and weaknesses of whatever referee you have. And you preserve the safety of the people on the field. Ah. <laughs> it doesn't matter the sport. That's the number one charge of an official in a sporting match. Nicola Bard, should VAR stay? It's a debate in France for a long time, in Europe, Tangent uh, also. Um, I prefer, personally, when we are confident with the, uh, the referee. Because we saw in these competitions that there are so many decisions with the VAR make discussions and um, bad feelings. And a uh, world championship is joy, happiness. What's happened? Yeah, does, happen. it, does it undermine the, the authority of the referee? I don't think it does. Again, I, I was involved in a match where there was an awful collision and a player intentionally, uh, fragrantly filed somebody. And uh, of course, we, uh, we whistled, we gave the person a technical, we ejected the player. And the number one thing is the official doesn't want to be that person that allows a serious injury. Mm. And so if we have to go to VAR to make sure that the call was right, I have no problem with that as long as I would not have been the person on the field allowing a serious injury, maybe career ending, uh, a serious injury. You have to step in and VAR can be the backup to, to show that the referee did do the right thing. I think that the real problem right now is that VAR is taking the power right now. Before, uh, the idea was that the referee was always having the final decision, but it's more and more becoming the VAR. And the strange thing was the VAR, what I found really strange was why were there male referees VAR during the World Cup. But okay, that's that's again another decision. But to give an example, I went to Canada against the Netherlands in Rams. And after one minute, Canada uh, uh, got a penalty. There was, uh, the referee was called to the VAR. It was, it, 
took four minutes or so. I was not in the press stand. I was just between the other supporters. And nobody knew what was going on. Okay, she was going to VR. She was going to check. Afterwards, they was showing on the screen. They, they said no handball, but there was no handball. So it, I think they use it not well at the moment. And what I think is really bad, because sports about emotion, right now, when there is an offside decision, they let him play. But at the moment then when they score the goal, they are going to raise the flag. You see it in the players. The players, they know at the moment when they start running that they may be offside and it's taking away all the emotions in the game. I, I strongly prefer that if, it's, if the assistant referee is 100% sure that it's offside, that they still give it offside. And if they are hesitating, okay, let them play. But now it's... Oh, uh, I think on. there was another issue in this uh, World Cup, and uh, I'm not for the women referees just for the sake of having women referees. Oh, no. And I saw plenty of uh, matches, and some of the referees, especially the assistant referees, were not up to speed, were not at the level of a World Cup. We saw a few games where the assistant referees did not know what they were doing. They mm -hmm. weren't making any calls. Well, during the final, we saw one ball go clearly out, and it was not yes, whistled. Yes, and that happened on several other... There were some very good referees, like uh, Frappard uh, from France for the final, but some of them did not know which way to raise their flag, whether it was offside, not offside, and they were waiting for the referee or for a VAR to cover them. And that, I think, is a real issue, is that the level of play has gone increasingly good and then the level of the referees hasn't not all of them but hasn't yet. quite followed from what i uh, saw in these games let's talk about the level of play because <laughs> yeah. what we saw in this tournament when we compare to when the u.s first won in 1999 20 years ago it's night and day isn't it i mean many of the teams yeah we had in the first round that 13 to nil blowout of uh, between usa thailand but a lot of the games they were incredibly, uh, uh, in terms of tactics, uh, technical astuteness, the coaching level has gone up. It's a different game. Certainly, so a different game. Um, I love the, the way the U U.S. team played. Sincerely, for me, is the best team which won the, the, the tournament. Uh, they, they play few games with high level. Um, uh, I think that um, now which is very different between 20 years ago, is the, the, the possibility the girl have to, to, to push the ball uh, straight on, a travers, a transversal. Yeah, I across. Say, across to the field. It wasn't possible 20 years ago um, because professional uh, players can tr have a training and they are more uh, powerful. And uh, this is also... Because um, be I heard a, f a commentator on French television saying, oh, maybe for women there should be 80-minute uh, matches, 40-minute halves instead of 45 minutes. What's your reaction to that? No, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous because when I began to play, we play 80 minutes and we play with a small boy. I I'm 60 and I played it 40 years ago. And uh, now I think that women have made the demonstration that we can play 19 minutes and with the same ball and with the same field. It's not a problem. We have to play soccer uh, in the way we are um, with uh, more probably uh, uh, tactical things and um, um, ta technical things also. But I, I saw uh, shoots very, very powerful. I saw the centre, how do you say that? Centres. Centres. Crosses. Incredible. The semi-final, you yeah. have three goals with centres. It was incredible. Yeah. Even if uh, uh, in the movement, uh, they are quick and they are straight. Uh, it's, coupé. <laughs> yeah. it's crazy. And the dribbling and the kind of the no-look passes, it was just really fantastic ball uh, handling uh, on a soccer field. Europeans are accustomed to that. In America, we haven't seen that for so long, but both teams were exhibiting that in the final. The, the way the teams moved down the field, the passes were crisp. It was exciting. And I watched part of this. I was watching here, but other times when I've watched uh, women's soccer games on my computer screen, I'm not sure those are women who were playing because the ball is moving as crisply as when I have seen men advance the ball down the field. And so absolutely the so level has gone up. What sets the women's game apart from the men one today? What's, what's the difference? Well, I think uh, that 
The difference is getting smaller between the women's game and the men's game. Obviously, I still think because we were uh, sometimes after the women's games, we would watch some uh, Copa America uh, games and we were a bit struck by the speed at which the men's game is going. So the speed is still not uh, the same. For me, what struck me most uh, in the progress that's been made in the women's game was the goalkeepers. Because four years ago, you saw so many hand mistakes, so many fumbles, uh, so many goals coming from a mistake from the goalkeeper. There, re there was even talk of getting the goals to be smaller because the women weren't good enough to stop uh, these shots. And in this competition, we saw some incredible goalkeeping. I mean, Sari Van Venendal in uh, this final, I mean, it could have been 3-0 by halftime had she not been there. And she made Beautiful save, and, she, and she's not the only one. And she's the backup keeper at Arsenal? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she is, but at the same time, yeah, she's she's already the national team uh, keeper for quite a long time uh, now. And I think what you say what you say is right. I mean, in the in the start of the tournament there were still some mistakes, but it got better and better. I think the the biggest problem right now is still that it's not and there were twenty four teams, but I think that with sixteen it would have been even better. Yeah, I mean there were now yeah, there's there's a big gap between the better teams, who all the teams who went to the second round. I think it was great that there were also two African teams uh, going to the second round. That was it was good, but still, okay. Yeah, Thailand is 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 a little bit mean to to take the example uh, again, to talk about them again. But there were also some other matches where there was a, quite a different, uh, a, a big difference. What you don't so see in the main game. Yeah. Each nation has its characteristics. Uh, we know the Dutch men's team, which is a very technical game. It, uh, it's the nation that invented total football. What 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 is the women's game? Does it resemble the men's game in any way? The strange thing is that it was when we when we when the Dutch team <laughs> became European champions in 2017, they played really like the men's team. And this time it wasn't like it. It was way more about be, playing like a team. It was really tactical. It was really it was also physical. I was quite surprised to see it. There was a lot of criticism in, in, in the Netherlands about the team because they said right now, OK, we saw you in 2017 then you played really great football. And now you win the matches, but it's not, that's really Dutch, I have to say, when it, we want to win, but we don't only want to win, we want to win with really good football. And they didn't show it the whole tournament, to be honest. I think only the second half against Italy in the quarterfinals, they played a really good game. But that's that's f fun to see that they, they got their own uh, character, characteristics, I'm sorry. All right, so uh, uh, better level. Uh, more interest, that of course means more money. How you distribute that money, we'll talk about it when we come back here watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate, and uh, we're Drawing conclusions uh, from a World Cup that broke lots of records, most goals uh, in a match, most goals in a tournament. We also saw uh, record audiences watching on television, and we're talking about it with France 24 sports editor Kedavon Gorgistani, who was uh, front and center at the final in Lyon on Sunday, as was Nicolas Barre, uh, former striker for the French national team and the co-founder of Egal Sport, Equal Sports, which... Uh, uh, promotes gender uh, parity in, in sports. Uh, former sports uh, reporter Nita Wiggins is uh, with us as well, the uh, author of Civil Rights Baby and Ruben Slachter of uh, Eurosport, uh, television co-author of Football Investigation, everything you need to know about football uh, in Russia. Uh, Nicolas Bar, the French, once again, uh, finishing in the quarterfinals, not going any further, but we saw huge television audiences, in particular for the France-Brazil game, for the France-USA game. Uh, we saw a French team that uh, fared honorably against uh, the Americans. How much of an effect do you think we'll see at the local club level? Or can we expect more young girls to want to play soccer? It, it is going to, see, to, to be something incredible for the society in France. It's um, more than just football. Uh, just, it's not just football. It just, it's not just soccer. It's something very, very important for the, the place of women in the society in France. Um, we can't believe that it could be 11 million 
of people in the first game on the TV. I was in 1999 in uh, Los Angeles. I saw the final and the US team won. It was uh, 100,000. 100,000 of people in the Rose Bowl in Los Angeles make me cry because in France was nobody in the, in the stadium to, to watch uh, soccer, women soccer. Um, we ask women to play a good football, a beautiful football and to win <laughs> because it's very important to convince all the people that we can be in this place. We can play, we can play everything. Even we can play soccer, rugby, make boxing. And um, this is what we have so many um, demand, ask for the women and, and they have to play also well. To so convince. the United States, well, I'll ask you Nita Wiggins. Okay, sure. um, uh, you in the late 60s had uh, this lawsuit uh, uh, over equal access to uh, sports facilities uh, in schools and universities, oh, Title right. IX as it's called. Uh, right, exactly. Um, so it's not the, uh, that big a deal in the U.S. You don't cry at the Rose Bowl when you see the stadium full. No, no, no. But it was in the 1980s that soccer started to... Uh, develop for for girls in particular. Boys always had what we call football, American rules football. But it was in the 80s that girls started to become more active in soccer. And I think that is what led to the championship with the USA team in 99. Because there was a, a generation of, of 18 year olds, 18 year olds, 20 year olds who would have been ready and, and their parents and their grandparents would have supported they're becoming active in sports but female, because of Title IX. Female athletes, it seems like it's, for us Europeans, mm -hmm. seems like it's something more deeply ingrained in the U.S. Uh, it is. Again, we have 320 million people in the United States, and there has to be some activity for, for young people. And as we in, in the United States started recognizing the importance of having girls become active because it would help them in their futures. It would help them to resist being uh, victims of abuse. It would teach them leadership. All of these attributes of, of sports competition, we started to talk about more in the United States at the time of Title IX. And the result was a wave of girls and teenagers who became active in sports such as volleyball, soccer, gymnastics, the numbers exploded. The participation numbers exploded. And that's why we have this wave of champions in soccer, in a sport that, that American girls weren't playing at first. An important point there made by Nita Wiggins, which is that in the U.S., sports is seen as something that helps you build character and leadership. Yeah. Is the problem in France a problem yeah. of sexism, or is it a problem of an disparaging attitude towards sports in general. <laughs> we, we don't give the, the place um, uh, to sports which deserve. It's not the same. In America, I, I, was, I was in the uh, United States and I saw the way parents uh, push, push the, the children mm -hmm. to do sports and this be part of um, the, the construction, the build of the personality. You have the university who, which paid for... Uh, for uh, athletes uh, and they pay the, the courses because the athlete is good. Uh, it's, it's crazy in France, you don't have this. Um, the fact is in the United States, soccer is for women. In France, soccer is for men. We have world championship, it's France in, in soccer, um, in the women and in, for men. So this is a very big difference of culture. We, we have Kedivan Gorgistani, women's teams doing well in France, in handball, in basketball. We they reached were, the final. They reached the final. In, in rugby, France beat New Zealand over the weekend. Um, and yet there is still the attitude described here. What's going on? Well, it is, uh, it is true that as I'm Franco-American, I grew up in France, but also in the U.S., and the way women or young girls, when they want to do sports that are not deemed for girls, I was prevented by my teacher from playing football. I wanted to play football. And he said, no, this is for the boys. You go and do track and field. And I was prevented from doing that. And the problem is in the US, there are thousands of girls who play soccer when they're kids and never don't play even in college and never become professionals. But you have this 
mass of people who are playing, and that's easier than to spot the stars and the upcoming uh, national team players. Whereas in France, you have to know from when you're seven, eight years old that you want to become a professional soccer player. That, I think, is where the problem is, is that that's why we have a smaller pool. Obviously, there's the population, but there's also a smaller pool of people who make it to the level of becoming a national team player. But the other part of Title IX is that it requires equal funding mm. for women's sports uh, to match men's sports at the university level. And consider an American rules football team at a university, there will be 80 male players on the team. And so somehow the universities have to find 80 athletic scholarships to fund for women. And the results have led to volleyball teams, soccer teams uh, for women, golf teams, uh, gymnastics teams. That's why we have great gymnast, gymnasts in the United States. It is thanks to Title IX funding and the, uh, the huge uh, number of male players who are playing American rules football. All right, the, the tournament that's just ended, it's brought smiles to the faces of sponsors, uh, TV rights holders, and of course, the president of the world football governing body, FIFA. Over one billion viewers all around the world. Which other event in the world, except for the Men's World Cup of football, can unite one billion people around the world to watch this? Hey, uh, if we were saying that perhaps there were too many teams, uh, he seems to think there are too few teams and would like to add more. I think that he also has other objectives. <laughs> with, uh, it's not only about the sportive objective, but also of people watching on TV. But, well, okay, I know his point of view. That's, uh, that's his right to say it. No, no, no problem. I think the organizers also were caught a little bit off guard by how popular this World Cup was. They were expecting it to be a bigger success than it was four years ago, but I don't think they had expected uh, this attendance. It was an average of 74% of attendance throughout the competition. They were aiming somewhere along the lines of 57, 60%. You saw it even in the first game we were there. They had a real problem getting people in because of the number of women. They didn't have enough security women oh, yeah. oh, sure. to get women inside the okay, stadium. Okay, so so you and Nicole, you're at you're in the stadium when there's this moment that will probably go down in history when fans in the crowd start chanting equal pay. pay. Describe it to us. Well, it was it, it was funny because it went from cheers of we, we won, we won, we won. It's the World Cup. We won the World Cup. We're champions. And then it turned into equal pay. Actually, uh, Gianni Infantino was also booed by the crowd uh, when he was uh, you know, hosting that ceremony. But the the, the American players uh, were saying after the game that hearing the stadium chant equal pay, they realized they were like, we understood at that moment that our fans and that the crowd and the people who are watching understand what we're about and what we've been fighting for. And they're behind us, not just for fun on the pitch, but also for what we are fighting for, which and was the big moment. They filed a lawsuit back in 2016. Uh, U.S. players, uh, they want to be paid the same amount uh, as, uh, uh, as the men's uh, national team. Their performances have certainly been better the last couple of years. Uh, the game's biggest star, Ada Hegerberg uh, of Norway, uh, she boycotted the tournament over this very issue, so it's not just the United States. Uh, Forbes magazine uh, calculating that uh, Neymar alone earns as much as more, in fact, than all the women in the top seven female leagues uh, around uh, the world, uh, that call of equal pay, uh, and there you see those seven leagues there. Uh, before I ask you about that call of equal pay, first of all, did Ada Hegeberg do the right thing by boycotting the tournament? Norway was qualified. Well, I was a player. I could have done the same for him. It was impossible for me not to play the World Championship because it was a dream. And I, I think it's a very, very big decision for her. And when you fight for something which is right, uh, when, something which is important and what that makes sense for so many people, so many women, I think sometimes you have to break your heart and you have to try to find so many ways 
to to say what you want to say. Rapino uh, played and speak. Uh, Agerbert say no, I don't want to to play, but she speaks. So we we not it's not a choice. Everything is good if it's you a, want to, it's a to say something. It's a personal decision. I think it's also important uh, to say because we're talking about equal pay and the lawsuit is about equal pay, but it's larger than just equal pay. And Ada Hegerberg, when our team interviewed her uh, right after she decided to uh, boycott and not play for the national team, they finally agreed to have equal pay between men and women, yet she didn't go back. And the question was, you were calling for equal pay. Why didn't you go back? Mm -hmm. She said, it's not just about money. If I were in it for the money, I wouldn't be playing women's football because there's no money in there. Uh, but the question is also equal treatment. There's a lot of things besides the money. There's how you train, the infrastructure, traveling, yeah. playing. Uh, remember four years ago, there was this whole debate because they were playing on AstroTurf and not a real pitch as opposed to the men. So there are a lot of other things than just the money. And I think uh, even the American players were focusing on equal pay because that's the first step. But they were also saying that we need the same investment, the same training, the same help around, the same medics, all of that. But now that important. now that the, now that it's popular, now that the sponsors are coming, is that just going to happen naturally? I think it's <laughs> going to take time if it does it, happen. I think the sponsors have caught on to it maybe faster than uh, the uh, football uh, bodies, because uh, we saw the announcers here in France, uh, TF1, the broadcaster of uh, this World Cup, uh, they had initially set a price for advertising during the games. When they saw that there were 11 million people in front of their screens on the first day, they uh, they raised, the raised it by 50 percent mm. for 30 seconds mm. and they had decided that they might not put these games if the french were not playing on their main channel they did that for the semi-finals and the semi-final and semi-final us versus england in france made three times the viewership as did the final of the men's champions league so yeah. it gives an idea of how much they were caught off guard by, but I don't think it's going to happen overnight. All right, the U.S. president congratulated the team, and uh, Donald Trump, when asked, said equal pay was something to look into. You have to see year-round how are they all drawn. What is the attendance for women's soccer outside of World Cup? Uh, but I would like to see it. So he says it depends. You know, you have... you. <laughs> Depends on the attendance for women's soccer outside of the World Cup, I think is what I, I just heard President Trump say. Well, we're discussing the national team, which is the team that would play in a World Cup. Uh, and, and so th this idea of whether the team will visit or whether Megan Rapinoe will visit the, the president, uh, I feel it's hurt. Each person has the individual uh, right, uh, as we were just saying on the panel. But uh, if I were on that team, I would go and visit the president uh, because, as Dr. King said, we have to look for legal and nonviolent ways to move the ball down the field in whatever discussion we're talking about. And so for a player to not visit uh, is, an opera, is, is a missed opportunity to communicate an idea. And I say that as an optimistic person. And so no one should be commanded to visit anyone, as far as I'm concerned. Donald Trump said he'd look into uh, inviting them. He didn't rule it out. What was your reaction to that remark? A look into inviting. It, it has been a tradition since the 60s for teams to visit, uh, championship teams to visit uh, presidents of the United States. And in fact, uh, President Kennedy had a presidential seal of fitness that a kid could earn. And I tried so hard to earn that by meeting different uh, standards in running and jumping. And so presidents have been kind of a motivating factor in physical fitness in the United States. And it would be a shame that we don't have players who go and visit, but a player who decides not to, I am behind that idea, but a player who goes should negotiate the opportunity to have a conversation and not just be there for a photo opportunity. Uh, Ruben Sada, you, your thoughts more broadly on this issue of equal pay, because is it, what's the criterion? Because that's the, now the discussion is on, under what, what, what criterion do you set for equal pay? 
That's that's the whole discussion. Uh, just to say that the Dutch king was there yesterday, so mm. he showed up at the tournament. But the players, they already said they didn't want to do anything if they lost the final. So there's nothing happening in Holland right now because they said, OK, we'll only do it when we win the final. But yeah, the, the whole question is, I mean, we saw the whole uh, Neymar stat, but I think that's not the, the discussion right now, especially in the uh, big leagues. Uh, they're not uh, the real the, the same attendance as like we had during this World Cup. If you go right now see a match of Olympic Lyon, which is the best team in the world, how many people are going to such a match? Maybe a few thousand. It's it's not on the same level yet. But the most important thing is for me in equal pace, like what you said before, is that the same they want the same treatment. It, uh, I think that for the American team it's already quite good, like for the nor nor. Uh, for the Norway team and also for the Dutch team. But there were other teams like Argentina, for example, they didn't have anything during this tournament. I think that's the start. And we should also be a little bit realistic, I think. It's still, we're still uh, starting it up. And we, I think that women's football is making giant steps already. It's now, well, if I just take the Dutch example, it's now 20 years that uh, a female football in Holland is getting, uh, that, that you can play, that, it's, that there's a real team. And in 20 years, they've made already huge steps. If you see that yesterday, there were uh, almost 6 million people until 18 million were watching in the Netherlands, the final. There's so many young girls already playing football right now. So for me, I think, I think it's just a matter of time. But let's first start with the national teams and then we can go on to the clubs. Uh, we have to consider one thing. Uh, if the, we speak about the salary of the girls in the club, it depends on economy, yeah. what you say. If we speak about uh, national team, it's a politic decision, decisions. The federations can decide that for every competition, she, she will pay the same men and women. It's, it's her money, it's her budget. She can, she can do it, and she can do it immediately. It's not an economic mm -hmm. problem. And as far as equal pay, the, according to the lawsuit filed by the U.S. Uh, women's players, the men are earning up to $13,000 per game during the friendlies that they play, the, the games leading up to competition. The women can earn $5,000 if they win, if they win. But the men are guaranteed between seven and 13000 per game regardless of the results. Of course, it's the, it's the question also of the attendance and all of that. But it's the national team, so it's a question of the tax money and the, the, the citizens who are paying for a product where one team is performing much better than the other. There's also a difference in the United States between the men's and women's team. There is a huge pay disparity, but uh, the American women have a base salary that they're paid when they're on the roster no matter what they play, if they play or not, whether the whereas the men are paid by the game and the roster is much wider, so they're paid by game, the women are paid a base salary plus a little bit of a bonus. That said, uh, the women four years ago, their bonus for winning the World Cup was, I think, a third of what the men got for reaching the last 16 at the World Cup uh, a little bit longer ago. And we saw the absence of uh, the men's team for the United States at the World Cup uh, in Russia. Ketevan Gorgistani, I want to thank you. I want to thank Nita Wiggins. I also want to thank uh, Nicola Bar, Ruben Slaughter. Stay with us, though. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to Emma James. Hi there. Uh, yes, everyone is talking about the Women's World Cup, especially here in France. France's uh, number one sports paper, L'Equipe, uh, devoted its front page to the American team. Uh, and their headline was great again. Uh, so, yes, that's um, a really interesting nod to the success of the US team. And it's also, I think, a little bit of a dig at um, Donald Trump. I'm not sure why we can't see the image. There we go. Um, because, of course, his slogan is MAGA, Make America Great Again. And uh, L'Equipe is claiming that the US uh, women's football team has done that for him already. Um, it, of course, features that famous pose that has seen uh, Megan Rapinoe being, being dubbed arrogant 
it's one of those things where you know men are a forceful, women are seen as aggressive, and I think that if a man celebrated in that way, nobody would think twice. But for some reason, um, it seems to offend certain people when she uh, does the arms wide uh, pose, which has been popping up absolutely everywhere. This article in Time magazine uh, is a really interesting one, saying that this win was basically the um, the best response they could have had to all the critics that have been out there, because really did they deserve to be criticised uh, throughout this World Cup? They We're talking about the tea drinking uh, during the semi-final that Alex Morgan did? Yes, I think, um, I think globally, certainly in the UK, um, in England in particular, the tea drinking was, was seen as really insulting and a lot of people very unhappy about it. But globally, I think this idea that Meghan was saying, no, she wasn't going to the White House. Uh, she's striking these very confident poses and it seemed to unsettle some people. Um, but what this article says is that the weight of expectation on the US team as the title holders uh, could easily have crushed them. And instead, they never once fell behind in any game during mm -hmm. this whole tournament, which is really impressive stuff. Um, and Meghan, of course, who incited such anger um, came out of this not only with the title but with the golden ball and the golden boots so the best trophies for best player and highest score which is about the best you can do really to silence your critics you might think uh, Donald Trump has congratulated them mm. uh, whether he will actually invite them or not we don't know he had said in a tweet a while back that he was going to invite them win or lose but he seems to have walked back on that a little bit now and now he's He's hedging his bets and hasn't mm. said whether he's going to invite them or not. Um, the war of words uh, that has gone on with uh, the, the US president and <laughs> Meghan uh, Rapinoe um, has caused a lot of people to take to social media and share images like this one. This is from the cartoonist uh, Pia Guerra. Uh, and you've got uh, Rapinoe kicking Donald Trump into the trash can. Um, this is uh, <laughs> such a vibe, says this Twitter user. Uh, of course, it's a, a doctored photograph. They've never stood on the White House lawn quite like that. Um, and this woman saying, I'm glad the president of France is there so that our new president, Meghan Rapinoe, can begin diplomatic <laughs> relations <laughs> immediately. Uh, of course, talking about after the final there where the, um, Emmanuel Macron was there to congratulate them all. Um, now, the thing that has caused a lot of controversy since the final, online at any rate, um, is the issue of the flag, because a lot of people mm. believe Megan Rapinoe has been disrespecting the flag. She has knelt during the national anthem before in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick and his protests against police brutality in the United States. Um, and it would appear that divided along political lines, people saw something last night that they weren't happy with. They believed that the flag was actually thrown to the floor and stamped on. Aww. I think it's a bit of a stretch. And it is interesting. This is a tweet from a Fox News consultant. Mm. Um, but you'll see it's been watched by 365,000 people. So this story is spreading very, very widely in sort of political circles and political leaning uh, circles to the right end of the spectrum. Um, this gentleman saying, I understand the excitement of the moment, but please never disrespect the flag by dropping it on the ground. Now, I should say it wasn't dropped by Meghan, although she has been blam blamed by some for it, some saying that she was actually trying to push it out, the, out of the hand of the other player. Um, and people saying you should be disturbed by this unpatriotic, narcissistic behaviour. Uh, Megan is neither a hero nor a role model, says this man. Well, another one says, I guess as long as they get their glory, they don't care. Uh, they don't actually care about the flag and the country it represents. Lots of very different views on it. It's worth taking a look again at this piece from USA Today, a reporter who travelled with the US team. She wrote this last week uh, and she had a quote from Megan Rapino in this piece, uh, which said that maybe you don't agree with every single way that I do it. I know that I'm not perfect, but I stand for honesty and for truth and for wanting to have the conversation. All right. Many thanks uh, for that, uh, Emma James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.